And I would like to introduce Professor Maria Luisa Calve. Calvo with uh, talk, with lecture on laser speckle interferometry theory and application. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. So when we started to uh, design the contents of this college that is dedicated to advanced techniques for bioimaging, one of the main idea was just to try to have like some, some kind of a convergence between what we were seeing here in the room in, in terms of fundamental basic knowledge and maybe some the theoretical approaches with what was needed later on just to be seen in the laboratories. For that, you cannot choose very complicated techniques for the simple reason that we, we should be needing a much larger infrastructure, which for the moment we have not. And then you see for, for what you were seeing in the preceding days in the laboratory, that essentially the, this is dedicated to techniques that are assembled with uh, not a very heavy infrastructure. So one of the techniques that it's very convenient for this type of uh, orientation of the, of the course, the contents, is just the laser speckle phenomenon. And this is what we are going to talk now about this fundamental. So we're uh, going to introduce some discussion about what it is the concept of laser speckle. How can we uh, interpret it in terms of uh, mathematical formalism? And we'll be discussing some classical techniques, in particular the difference between what we name stationary and dynamic laser speckle imaging. So first, do, do not forget just, just to focus the idea that this is an imaging technique, okay? So what you're just going, in any case, to analyze is the image of this speckle phenomenon. Uh, we will mention about this image forming system and uh, mention briefly some applications in biomedicine because now there is a, a special term for this. This is biospecule. It turns out that this, as I'm going to mention now, that the speckle phenomenon is very interesting for biomedical application. And one of the reasons you immediately are going to understand is that it, it is a, a kind of assembling a non-invasive -inva technique. So when we are just dealing with techniques in, for example, diagnosis techniques or, or some following some patient treatment, it's very important just to look for non-invasive. And a speckle could be in one of these as in, 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 under certain conditions, of course, as I'll be mentioning now. So those are the uh, contents of the slide. The introduction, the speckle formalist. Uh, I'll be just uh, talking about the first order statistics, which is the easiest way to understand a speckle as a random interference phenomenon. I'll take the special case of an image forming system, and then I'll be uh, giving some details about what it is, this dynamic speckle in image forming systems. I'll mention uh, also some equivalent phenomenon that can be uh, observed in nonlinear optics. And as I say, I'll give some examples of biospecular. And uh, in the end, what I'm going to show you is the explanation of what you are going to see in the experimental laboratory. So those of you who are going to have the laboratory this afternoon, the groups four and five, you're going to see this experiment in speckle, and then the other groups will distribute it in, in next uh, coming days. So 
to what we understand by a speckle. This phenomenon was observed, starting be, being observed early in the 60s of the uh, 20th century. And the main reason was the introduction of these new highly coherent laser sources, which is the laser, one of the, those many collections of laser sources that we know today. So having these new laser sources with such a high coherent, spatiotemporal coherent properties, what happened is that they were revealing like a new phenomenon that was not observed before, apart maybe from uh, in precedent uh, centuries by L'Oreilly and some others observing phenomena in nature, in atmospheric phenomena, for example. So um, there was this uh, pioneering work done by Joe, Joe Goodman and Chris Dainty in which they introduced uh, what it is the fundamentals and the basics of a speckle. And then we can say that this speckle is observed when we are illuminating a surface with a highly coherent source as it is the case of a laser. This is what you are having here. Uh, this is the surface. And then as you are seeing in the profile of the surface, of the surface this is kind of a random irregularities. This is due to the rough. And then if we illuminate with a highly coherent beam, what we are going to have here is a phenomenon of multiple scattering. What is the meaning of multiple scattering? What we are meaning by multiple scattering is that each one of the individual scatters are scattering light, but since we are dealing with very highly coherent beam, then we are going to observe also interference between these scattered fields. Therefore, do not Los, uh, uh, paying the attention that in a, a speckle phenomenon, we are having a very complex uh, explanation because we are having multiple scattering. Of course, here in, the light, in, in light diffraction, we can also interpret, and we are also going to have interference. And the structure that we are seeing when we illuminate a rough surface with a, a, for example, with a helium neon laser. Well, here's it, here is in blue, but imagine that it's in red, as you're going to see later on. This is the structure of what we are seeing. If I illuminate now with my, my pointer laser, this, this uh, white page, this white page, it's having a certain rough uh, it, this, this rough is, is uh, what it is formed. This is scattered center. And then you'll see, I mean, maybe from far you are not going to be able to see it, but if you approach, uh, you are uh, seeing not only what it is saying, the projection of the beam in, in, the, in this uh, screen, but you are seeing also a kind of a hello uh, surrounded in which what you are observing is the uh, speckle uh, structure. So how can we demonstrate that speckle phenomenon is arising from the coherent properties of the lasers? For that, what you have here is what it is known as the Considinis experiment. The Considinis experiment consists of having a double slit, John double slit, and then after the plane of the double slit, you can introduce a diffuser, and then of course, you'll have the observation plane. You have here the, the double slit plane. Do 
to illuminate. This has to be a laser, of course, highly coherent source. Then you introduce here the diffuser and then some point after the uh, double slit, the interferometer plane, you'll have here the image of what you are going to see. If we observe here uh, what we are having in this plane, of course, this is a speckle pattern, it's a speckle structure, which is looking uh, a little bit more into it. It's having this random uh, structure. But not this, I am, I am not sure if you can just see it from there very well. So you can notice that inside the speckle structure, inside the areas in which you are having these bright spots, okay, here, you are seeing fringes. Because of course, what you are having is this double effect of having the uh, interferometer experiment and the uh, diffuser that is producing the speckle. So you are having this structure, this is a speckle, but in these areas uh, inside the bright spots, we are seeing fringes then telling us that in this phenomenon, we are dealing with a certain degree of coherence. If now I'm moving slowly the diffuser, so now the diffuser in what I'm explaining you here, the diffuser is static. Now if I start moving the diffuser, it turns out that what happened is that the fringes and this structure disappear. And what we are having is just this like an uh, incoherent beam illuminating the image plane. The fact that we were moving the diffuser was what we know as temporal decorrelation. So what we were doing was to decorrelate the temporal coherence properties of the beam. And therefore, we are not able to see the speckle anymore. So, uh, we fix ideas that from an incoherent source up to a very highly coherent source, I can have quite a degree of uh, coherence in the sources. In a very highly coherent, with a very highly coherent source, my speckle will have good quality, but of course, I can, could be used some partially coherent source that will be less quality. And with an um, incoherent beam, in what I'm just explaining to you now, I am not going to have a speckle because, of course, I'm going to have a scattering with, it, with this beam. But I am not going to have constructive and destructive interferences. <coughs> so uh, you are seeing here a more detailed uh, um, speckle pattern. This is interaction of a helium neon laser in a, a slight a plastic slide. So you are seeing here like a, a complex structure. Here at the center, this is what the equivalent to that is this kind of a diffraction pattern as you are seeing here. But then going to the uh, other areas of the pattern, we can observe that there is forming uh, bright spots. Here is when the bright spots appear when we are having uh, highly constructive interferences and dark spots, for example, here, it's when we are having destructive interferences. So in, in all the specular structure, what we are going to have is a distribution of the irradiance in this plane. Okay, we are going to have a distribution of the irradiance. And this distribution is a continue, is a continuum of values that are going from the minimum up to the maximum, the brightest spot. 
So because of this appearance, they say this is a chaotic jumble, uh, it, it's introduced in the name of speckle. We noticed too that I was, I was showing you now here with this red uh, emission, our eye is able to observe the speckle. So a speckle phenomenon you can, is becoming visible to naked eye. But um, I would like to mention that these days there, there is a, a, a lot of uh, work in a speckle with other type of sources, uh, having, of course, a certain degree of coherence, as it is the case for the X-ray. And this is having a very interesting application in biomedicine, too. So how could we interpret this chaotic phenomenon of a speckle? Let me mention that in the beginning, when this, when this phenomenon was observed, it was observed when someone was dealing with image formation with a highly coherent source. And then it wasn't good because we do not want such an amount of, of information in the image plane. And the speckle was introducing kind of a noise. This is making a misinterpretation of what was really what is in the image plane. Therefore, in the beginning, it was like some undesirable effect for what it was this image forming system. And they were looking about uh, eliminating the speckle in one of the uh, ways to do it is, as I was mentioning to you before, is like by introducing a temporal decorrelation with the source. But later on, it came to, uh, with all these contributions of works, one start appreciating that a speckle contains a very complex information about the structure of what? of the rough surface. And then starting a very important area that is introduced in metrology, and later on also seeing that it can be applied in certain areas of biomedicine. So it was passing from, uh, this is a good example of how science can turn uh, for, for some phenomenon that we can think that this is not good I don't want to have this effect. It's just uh, turning out that now we are using this effect for other purposes. So how can we interpret? We need a formalism to interpret what it is happening. For that, uh, I'm going to follow the Goodman uh, treatment. We have this very well-known random work model. Random work model is very well known, not only in the area of, of optics, but it can be used to explain uh, chaotic processes in some other areas uh, of what we want to interpret. And then what we're going to uh, assume is that uh, we have uh, this single scattering of the coherent light and what we are going to have is a collection of particles. Remember, each point of the rad surface acts as a skater. skater. We are uh, considering, just uh, as, uh, assuming, you know, what kind of scattering are we having. So we assume that we, uh, the scattered dimension is much greater than the wavelength of the uh, illuminating radiation. And then uh, we're also considering that if we, what we are having here is the scalar field. Uh, we are assuming that there is no depolarization in this formalism. This is very important because we know that when there, there is a reflection, we have light and there is reflection. I'm sure that many of you have observed that there is a slight depolarization. So in this case, we are not considering such, a, such an effect. And we are going uh, to work just with the scalar field. And of course, 
is not in the formula, but you all uh, understand that. This is going to depend on the spatial coordinates and time and, uh, and going to the, uh, to the what it is in the, in the right side of the equation. Uh, same for the amplitude. And the same for the phase. So this is the starting point. And this is a starting point. And uh, of course, you see the phases moving in between these values. And it's statistically independent from the amplitude. You are seeing here that what we are having is a discrete superposition. What we are telling is that each one of these scattering phenomena are being superimposed in the form of, of this summation. And then N it, it, it is the number of the independent contributions. Then what we are going to study, or what we are going to say, is that the scattering amplitude has associated a probability density function. Apart from what we are seeing here for what, what I was explaining, uh, in this random walk model, we uh, can represent in a complex plane. And then what we are having here is the phasor. Uh, in this case, in red, this is the constructive addition. And in this case, this is the destructive addition. So in between these two, that can be kind of very variable, walking, random processes uh, as represented in the complex plane. So how can we define this probability density function? For that, I'm going back in time, maybe one, it's going to be soon 100 years uh, from the contribution of Lord Riley in 1990 in the Philosophical Magazine. And um, I'll try to read. It's not, it's not well uh, written there. When the phases are at, at random, the resultant amplitude is indeterminate. And all that can be said relates to the probability of various amplitudes, to the probability of various amplitudes, or more strictly, to the probability that the amplitude lies within this limit. Okay, so this is a probabilistic interpretation. We cannot assure what is going to be the value of the amplitude. Therefore, we need to introduce some statistical description. In, in his work, Lord Riley was defining this probability density function, as I say, assuming that the phase is independent from the amplitude. And what you're having here is the radial profile of the joint, joint probability density function. So this is a case that we consider that is having like a radial symmetry for convenience. Uh, and what, if you observe what we, uh, this is the faster component. And if you observe, this is the uh, zero order Bessel function. And N is, the, is a finite number. It's a finite number. And uh, what we are having here in between brackets, this is the average over the ensemble of all the scattering amplitudes. If we observe in detail this formula, we notice that applying the Fourier analyze, we know that this is a Bessel Fourier or Hankel transform. Then what we are having here uh, uh, to interpret this probability density function is a Bessel Fourier transform of what it is this ensemble of amplitudes in this and finite, finite number of events. 
So what happened is that this formula is having difficulties to be solved analytically, because I insist that here n is a finite number, so we cannot consider that it, it goes to infinity, just to make, for example, an approximation. We need to maintain that n is finite. So this is very complicated to be solved from the analytical point of view. And also, even if you would like just to, of course, you can try numerically, that's always possible. But it is also uh, introducing difficulty. So we are going to some uh, simplification of the interpretation. And in what it is, this is statistical properties of the amplitude. We know that we can consider uh, the process of being Gaussian or non-Gaussian. So of course, we are going to choose the process to be a Gaussian one. And this is what it is, the first order statistics. And this is very convenient. And for what we are just needing after that, just to arrive to characterize the speckle, it's convenient to use this uh, Gaussian statistics. And we are having here the first order, second order moment. And it turns out that uh, when we now introduce the, the mm, uh, assuming that this number n tends to infinity, what we are seeing here in this second equation, uh, this it goes to zero, it goes to zero, so this is just having a constant value. And then we can interpret the process having a Gaussian statistics. And what you are having represented here, this is from uh, work of Chris Dainty. Um, this is, those are real measurements. It's a histogram taken from a speckle pattern. It's 23,000 uh, events. And this is what we are obtaining for the histogram. It turns out that it behaves as a negative exponential. So this is what we are going to consider in what all that it is coming after that. The ones that we can settle the formalism and the type of statistics that we are going to apply, then we can go too far just to see what the type of application that we can do. And then notice that uh, uh, here, when this probability density function is one, that it corresponding to the case of the intensity being zero. So let us take an example. I was mentioning before that in an image forming system, we initially were not interested in speckle, but later on, analyzing the speckle given us uh, interesting information about the structure. So what, what we are having here, this is the simplest case of an image forming system. You're having here the object plane just one lens and the image plane. And then in the object plane, what you are having is the rough surface. So what you want to check is what is going to be the structure in the image plane. Uh, we are, uh, remember that we are working under the conditions that the, uh, the scattered dimension is larger than the wavelength. And in, in this particular case, since we are having just one lens, um, this is going to coincide with the aperture pupil, the pupil plane, and the entrance pupil of the system. So what is going to be, how are we going to calculate the maximum size of uh, the image speckle? Okay, say that we are going to have here quite a distribution, as you are having here in these examples. Uh, this is the, for the particular case in a hard Sharman sensor. So we are going to have here kind of a certain complicated structure, and we want to know what is going to be the size of this speckle image in the case of the uh, the lens is aberration free. For that, we use the theory of diffraction. This is what we are 
using. Because we need to take into account the resolution of the system. And if we remember the relay uh, uh, criterion, and then we need just to know what it is happening with the response of the, um, of the, uh, of the system to punctual sources. But this is the equivalent to say that I want to study the point spread function of each scatter. So each scatter, according to the theory of diffraction of light, each scatter in this system is having it, it corresponding uh, point spread function. This is going to be in this, in this plane, and in here we are going to have this sort of contributions. So we are uh, taking uh, the airy disk as the diffraction pattern reference, and we define the, the size of the speckle. You see that is proportional to the wavelength. What we are having here is the magnification of the system, and what we are having here, this ratio, this is nothing else but the F number of the system. So under normal conditions, if we are using this formula, we can know what is going to be the, the size of the, uh, of the speckle in, in, the, uh, in the image plane. There are restrictions according to what we're, we know about this spatial resolution, their restrictions is that this formula, as far as I was uh, reading from some um, contributions at this one, uh, it does not hold for high resolution optical systems because we can have been considering that in high resolution optical systems, imagine that we are having one micron of the size of the, uh, of the uh, speckle, and then we are going to have problems to interpret here in terms of resolution. So we have, uh, we can characterize this through the theory of the diffraction, and another important parameter is, as in any other process with light and image formation, is the contrast factor, the speckle contrast. The speckle contrast is the ratio between the standard deviation and the intensity average. So that when this, this uh, speckle contrast is just one, what means is the, the deviation in that case is equal to the average, and then it's saying that the speckle is fully developed when the contrast equals one. And uh, if not, this, this value uh, is, it, it goes from zero up to, up to one. We are going to talk about the speckle contrast later on in some of the cases that we are going to consider. So this is just to finish with this. Uh, uh, this uh, part of the, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you something I think important that I was missing. You don't need this system to observe speckle. I was taking this case because it's easier for you to understand the way we are just introducing this definition. But of course, if you remove the lens, okay, imagine that you remove the lens and you just have the object plane with this uh, rad surface and then a certain uh, detection play, plane after that, you can also observe, of course, a speckle. This is the far field case of a speckle. If I introduce the lens, then I, I, I know that this is just going to be uh, acting as, as the geometrical orbits tell me as an image forming system. But if, if I withdraw the lens, I always have the phenomenon as well. So I was saying that to finish with this, what can we interpret uh, uh, 
to the light of what, what I was uh, telling you about the, uh, the point spread function. Uh, so we are having in the image plane, it's a collection of point spread functions that are going to be uh, randomly distributed and in which you are seeing here what will be kind of the projection and in which of course you have all sort of possibilities that uh, this is uh, result or not result or constructive or destructive interference. Okay, so, um, sorry, mm, uh, since I needed to use a PDF file and you are not going to see this movie. I'm very sorry. So what we were uh, explaining before is just what we name a static speckle. A static speckle means that this diffusive surface is a static is not moving. But uh, this is what will be here and here that you cannot see it. Um, and even in the, in the slide, uh, it's, it's all, all PDF, I'm very sorry. So here what you will see is that this is, this is all moving, as what I'm just doing here, it's all moving and they're saying that this is a boiling structure. So when we're having uh, the case of this uh, surface, this scattering medium is changing with time, it is evolving with time, then the speckle pattern also evolves, of course. And then what we're obtaining is what it is named this time variable speckle or shortly dynamic. So uh, I was, we were just seeing that for a static speckle, we are just having this definition for the contrast. And in the ca case of the moving speckle, we need to redefine the contrast. Why? Because there is fluctuation of the intensity. If we are having this boiling structure here, so we are going to have uh, changes, the intensity fluctuates, and we need to extract information about this speckle contrast, what it is going to be the level of blurring. So it's going to be a blurring in the structure because of this moving. That can help us to set up very interesting applications in biomedicine. So in, in the case of this moving speckle pattern, uh, the definition is the same, but notice that now we are introducing like different parameters. Uh, we're using this tau c, that's the speckle autocorrelation time, and t, which is this exposure time. So start fixing ideas because in the experiment that you're going to see this afternoon, you need to fix the exposure time. And I'll explain you later on why. So this you're having here a very interesting application of this dynamic speckle in biomedicine. And it, this is just now, uh, is a very well-known technique by the name of flowmetry. And what it is possible to study is the, the, the blood flow. So what you, you are having here, this is a, a healthy hand, the palm that is being illuminated just to create a speckle and then uh, having uh, the procedure for uh, digitally, you need to obtain this ratio here, and then you are just obtaining like a, ma a map. This is uh, what it is named, the laser speckle contrast image. And, and it is named perfusion map, uh, because what you are seeing here is how is the blood flu in, in the palm of the hand. Uh, this, the blue part, it's, it's low velocity, and the, and the red is the fast velocity. So here, we need to introduce as well the parameter of the velocity that it's uh, inverse to the contrast. So in that case, um, 
the, the more general approach for the contrast in this dynamic speckle case is the formula that you are having here. Uh, and we can consider be an ideal case of a Gaussian distribution for the velocity or a Lorentzian distribution for the velocity. And you see that uh, in the case of the Gaussian, it can saturate and go into one. Uh, in the Laurentian, we are not having that, but we can go to apart, uh, start from these values. This is represented, this is tau z over, over the exposure time. And what you are having here is the contrast. So as I was explaining to you before, the contrast is moving in between zero and one. And when you are having certain value of the contrast, that is uh, close to zero or a little bit higher than zero, what it, it is giving to you uh, is the information that the scatters are moving because you are going to obtain a bl blurring in the image. And when you are observing a blurring, this, this means that you are having dynamic speckle. And then these scatters are moving fast enough that you can perform the average uh, out of all the uh, speckle patterns. So this is the way you see that we can make kind of a difference between the static speckle and the dynamic speckle. And I would like to mention to you, this is a very, very interesting result that is, it's, it's been published quite recently uh, by the group of Mordegaisegev. And it's that they have revealed uh, the formation of a speckle in, uh, in, so in incoherent optical spatial solitons. Uh, this is the um, experiment that they have um, assembled, uh, essentially is like a Maxender interferometer, and then in one arm you are having ordinary polarization, and then in the other arm, notice you are having here the rotation diffuser, and of course, because you need the formation of this um, incoherent uh, spatial solitons, you need a nonlinear effect, therefore you need here to use a crystal. This is uh, the location of the crystal. Just because of the photorefractive effect, you are just going to get a nonlinear phenomenon in which uh, these beams can, are self-trapped. And then they are forming this incoherent distribution of the spatial solitons. You are having here uh, how it's this structure. Uh, when uh, in terms of the power of, this, of the illumination source. And of course here, as I was mentioning to you at the very beginning, if the diffuser is stationary, it reveals the presence of the speckle. And if the diffuser is rotating, you see that it's, it's just behaving as a thermal source. It turns out that for what they're, they're saying, I wanted just to, to show you this because this is quite a different uh, phenomenon just to uh, study speckle. Uh, and for what uh, are they say these authors, it can be used to study uh, some um, surface, solid surface, material surfaces. So uh, let us go now to some applications of speckle in biomedicine is what it is named biospeckle. You can see here in this, in this scheme the possible different phenomena that we can take into account when light is interacting with a material medium. You see that there are, there are many possibilities. And uh, we are having this input, then of course, depending on the reflection of the surface, we are having this uh, specular reflection, and for that, we have the Fresnel formula, just to calculate the reflectance. Uh, we are having, let us take the direct transmission, this one. This is what it is called the ballistic photon. Uh, we can have 
a kind of a diffuse transmission here. As you are, you are seeing here, this is a snake photon, the diffused photon. And in, in this case, when light is transmitted, of course, we can use the Lambert law and uh, also the Fresnel, uh, the Fresnel formula. And when we are having this diffuse reflection, of course, we can have absorption. Uh, since this is a scattering medium, uh, of course, we are also having a scattering. So see the amount of phenomenon that you can deal when the light is interacting with a material medium, and in which, for example, assume now that this is a biological medium. So you can have reflection, transmission, scattering, and as explained in here. So how can we use this phenomenon? So I'll take the example of the skin. You have here this, this skin of the, of the dermis. It's the dermis and the epidermis. And then, of course, you understand that this is quite a very complex structure. It, we don't have to forget that we are illuminating. We are illuminating with highly coherent laser source. And therefore, all these structures here, they're causing uh, effects as the one we were mentioning. You can have absorption, uh, you can have uh, partial reflection, partial transmission, and of course you're going to have a scattering. Uh, and, and this is because of all these inclusions that we are mentioning. Uh, we notice this epidermis thickness, it's going between 0.1 to 0.3 millimeters, and the dermis thickness it goes from 1 to 3 millimeters. So in this thickness is when you can have all these complex phenomena. And what we want is just to use the speckle. And the speckle uh, for the same example as I was giving to you before, this is the uh, contrast imaging, laser speckle contrast, Im contrast imaging. And we also can understand that because uh, the main component is water, uh, we are going to have, this is the absorb, uh, absorption spectrum of, of the water. We have here the peak. Uh, so depending uh, of which wave, wavelength are we using for this uh, process, we are going to have more or less absorption. Uh, you are having here the skin absorption coefficient and the skin sc scattering coefficient. So what it's possible to apply, as I was mentioning to you, this flow metry. In this case, what you are having here is the case of a patient that was having um, kind of a stain here in, in the face. Uh, and this stain it was treated. I cannot give you, I mean, um, de more details about it. But the, this, this uh, stain in the face was treated. So what there was, uh, they, they were studying the dynamic speckle of the face before and after the treatment. And what it is observed is that there is a, an important change in, in what it is uh, obtained. This is before. So you are, you are seeing here the kind of distribution of this blood velocity and after uh, this is after 15 minutes of therapy, laser therapy. Uh, this is mm, being more homogenized. So you see here a ex very nice example of a non-invasive treatment based upon speckle for, for this uh, biomedical application. So let us, uh, let, let us finish with uh, the scheme of the experiment, you are going to see this afternoon, the, the groups will be there and in the forthcoming days too. So what, what you're going to observe, uh, uh, this has been assembled by, by Professor Humberto Cabrera. So what you are going to observe is an example of dynamic speckle. This is the setup, so you notice, as I was mentioning to you before, you see that this experimental setup, uh, you do not need quite a heavy infrastructure. 
you have the helium neon lasers here. This is the mirror, the lens. Here is the diffuser, the diaphragm. Uh, and here you are having the sample plate in which you are going to introduce the sample. And then it goes to a camera. And uh, what you're going to, to take is a sequence of a speckle patterns, a sequence. Because for what I'm going to explain to you now, this speckle pattern is evolving in time. It's not a static speckle. Uh, what, uh, th this is an example of what you could use. We'll observe. What, what you are going to use in this particular experiment in, in the lab, this is an ethanol drop. An ethanol drop has the facility that you can see very nicely the temporal evolution of the speckle. And it could also give you an idea that imagine that what you are having here is a biological sample, some cultivar of cells. And then you can use also the same idea just to obtain this sequence of speckles just to see the evolution, uh, temporal evolution of the uh, structure of the sample. So we were mentioning that this is an ethanol drop. You have the camera. You're going to obtain a sequence uh, frame by frame in the image processing. And you have to fix the detection time. Remember when we were just uh, telling about the contrast in dynamic speckle that we need to take into account the exposure time. So uh, notice here this detection time or exposure time is the order of 15 seconds. And you are going to see now why this is so short. Uh, then you, you, you need to have a capture system like LabVIEW, the program made with MATLAB, uh, to compose these frame uh, sequences, uh, needing an algorithm and the uh, method temporal difference method. And then you can just, with this, arrive to see this uh, activity of the biospeckle through the interpretation of the contrast as the, uh, the contrast as a function of the number of frames. So let me, let me show you now the video. Okay, so what you are having here is the evaporation process of an eth ethanol droplet. Uh, you are not seeing here the, oh, there, okay. We, you see this is 24, 25, 26 seconds, 28, so the speed of evaporation of the ethanol drop, this is, is, goes very fast. And what it's important to notice, I want to repeat it. So what we, you may notice is that to study, you are not seeing here a speckle because this is just to see the, this evaporation time. To study the speckles, you need an area uh, somehow maintaining a little bit like uniform. So seeing that this is already 19 seconds, 20 seconds, 21, 22. So now it's collapsing in the surface is disappearing the ethanol drop. 
and in saying that in 30 seconds, you are not going to be able to take any measurements. So that's the reason why in this particular case, you need to fix this exposure time to 50 seconds. Of course, if you are just making a different application, you'll be forced as well to fix this uh, exposure time. Where is the uh, here? Okay, so uh, uh, this is the uh, scheme of what you are, so you are going to see it in the lab. So as, as, as conclusions, we, we have introduced this uh, concept of a speckle phenomenon. We have been uh, studying uh, in a very basic way the formalism the possible applications, the parameters needed. And then uh, what is very important is to notice that right now, these days, this speckle phenomenon is having quite a lot of applications. I was mentioning biomedicine because this is the topic of this college, but it's also being applied in metrology, uh, analysis of surfaces, and many other type of application. And uh, one of the things that I would like just to enhance for those of you that, uh, who are just teaching, that this is a very good example just to introduce uh, uh, to the level of, uh, of a teaching laboratory uh, because it's having a very, very nice content is to deal with the concept of coherence. This is very convenient to deal with the concept of coherence. And I'll mention to you these main seminal references, these two, these two books from, from Chris Dainty and Drew Goodman. And also, I, I recommend those of you who are interested in this uh, biomedical application, this, um, this article from, from Bosch. It's very, very nicely done. And that's all. Many thanks.